Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the public opening of the Fields Medal Symposium for this year. This is an annual series of events at the, with field, hosted by the Fields Institute, established in 2012, endorsed by the International Mathematical Union. And the purpose, of course, is to highlight the recent Fields Medals awarded every four years at the International Congress of Mathematicians. And this symposium, quite clearly, we're celebrating the achievements of Martin Herrer, Fields Medalist in 2014, exploring new directions from his work. There's a rich scientific program which started this morning at the Institute and continues through the week. <clears throat> and on Tuesday evening, one of the usual events is a, an opportunity for students to meet with the medalist in an informal uh, session. <clears throat> and, and then the program continues after that. So it's going to be a very uh, stimulating and interesting week of science at the, at the Institute. I would, of course, like to thank the, all the organizers for putting together the program and making the, the arrangements, and our own uh, staff, Esther Benzunda, Fields Program Team, for all of the local arrangements. <clears throat> Maybe I'll just take a minute or two of your time to tell you, say a few words about the Fields Institute. Uh, the goal of the Fields Institute mandate is to promote mathematical research in the widest sense and to enhance the visibility and impact of mathematics in our society. So our major support comes from the Ontario government through the Ministry of Research, Innovation and Science. And we'll hear from the minister a little bit later. And from the Government of Canada through our NSERC, National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. <clears throat> In addition, we are greatly appreciative of the support of our nine principal sponsor universities, which are the largest universities in Ontario, 11 affiliate universities, private donors and corporate sponsors. <clears throat> and briefly, at the Fields Institute, we have activities, mathematical activities of all sorts of scales, from one day, two days, week-long workshops, month-long focus programs, and then six months of intensive, coherent activity at the Institute. We also do summer research experience for undergraduates, outreach to mathematics education, mathematical applications to problems in industry, there's a, quite a wide spectrum of activity, and you could, I encourage you actually to find out more about it, if you like, by looking at our, our webpage. The Fields Institute was founded in 1992 at the University of Waterloo and moved to the University of Toronto campus in 1995. And if you haven't been to our beautiful building, I can see many of you here, I recognize, certainly have, but others perhaps not, do please come in and, and uh, take a look. You might also be interested in that there's an ebook which we prepared called The Fields Institute Turns 25, since this is our 25th anniversary. It's a book of stories about the Institute. It's available on our, our webpage. Now I'd like to recognize the additional sponsors who are specifically for the Fields Medal Symposium, because that's how it started, by collecting together support from interested donors. We have and still very much appreciate the gold level sponsorship of the Great West Life group of insurance companies, instrumental in establishing the series. And also very pleased now to recognize Elsevier as a gold level sponsor. This is now the second year of their gold level sponsorship. Our civil, silver level sponsor, Jim Stewart, is a deceased old friend of the Institute, former colleague of mine at McMaster, author of the most widely adopted calculus textbook ever. <clears throat> Many of our bronze level sponsors are with us this evening and we gratefully acknowledge all of their support. <clears throat> now the next item uh, on the program is to read to you a message that we have from the uh, Minister of Science, Kirsty Duncan. She wasn't able to be here this evening but did send a, a short written message that I'd, I'd like just to, uh, just to read to you. So this, this is not me. but. Kirsty Duncan. <clears throat> On behalf of the Government of Canada, you can see it's not me, please accept my best wishes for a productive 2017 Fields Medal Symposium. Congratulations to the organizing committee and everyone here at the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences for putting together such a great program again this year. To everyone joining today, graduate students, mathematicians, and scientists, thank you for all the work you do to celebrate and enhance mathematics in Canada and around the world. 
I would also like to acknowledge <clears throat> Martin Herrer, world leader in stochastic analysis and 2014 Fields Medal winner. His research is the driving focus for this year's symposium. As Minister of Science, one of my key priorities is to promote the participation of women in the STEM fields. I think that your guest speaker this evening, Professor Silvio Serfati from the Corrin Institute of Sciences in New York, will be an inspiration to many of you in this audience. I wish you every success throughout the conference and look forward to the many discoveries your conversations will surely ignite. Thank you and enjoy the 2017 symposium. So, Minister Duncan. <clears throat> My next very pleasant privilege is to introduce the Honorable Reza Maridi, the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. We just say a very few words that Dr. Maridi is an award-winning engineer and scientist with expertise in medical physics and radiation safety. He was Vice President and Chief Scientist at the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada for 17 years prior to entering political life. He served as the member of MPP for Richmond Hill since 2007. And as mentioned before, Government of Ontario is one of the major supporters of fields over the last 25 years. Minister Reedy, please. Well, thank you very much, Ian, for that very kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to join you here tonight for the Fields Medal Symposium and to honor the 2014 Fields Medalist, Martin Herrer, and his distinguished career. I would first like to acknowledge two very special people who are sadly no longer with us. Maria Mizahani was a brilliant mathematician who focused on theoretical mathematics. It's so unfortunate that we lost such a brilliant mind at this, such a young age. Maryam earned a BSc from Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, Iran, and a PhD at Harvard, and became a professor at Stanford University in the United States. Her work and the passion on curved surfaces has made major contributions to geometry. Maryam received the Fields Medal in 2014, becoming the first woman and the first Iranian to receive this medal. I understand Fields Institute intends to dedicate the 2018 Fields Symposium to her memory and the work which is appropriate. I know she will continue to be an inspiration to everyone in mathematics and beyond, especially young women interested in pursuing mathematics. I offer my heartfelt condolences to her family, friends, and the people here today who knew her. We also lost another great mind uh, this year, Lutfi A. Zadeh, who was a giant in mathematics, computer science, electrical engineering, and artificial intelligence. Lutfizadeh graduated with a BSc from Tehran University in Iran and a PhD from Columbia University in New York and went on to become Dean of Engineering at Berkeley. He is best known for his work as on fuzzy logic. Both Maryam and Lutfi his legacy will live on, especially among people in this room. You, you are some of the world's best mathematicians, researchers, engineers, and students, including Fields Medal recipient Martin Herr, who are, we are honoring tonight. His genius lies in the question of universality of systems and stochastic analysis, which has a great relevance in quantum field theory and statistical mechanics. Ladies and gentlemen, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the Fields Institute. 
and I offer my sincere congratulations to Ian and to the Institute on what you have achieved. Government of Ontario has been a proud supporter since the Institute's very beginning. Your work provides a deep and a strong foundation for innovation and indeed for education. And there has never been a better time to study mathematics. Before becoming a public servant, I was a scientist, as you heard, an academic and a researcher. And the one thing was constant, though my career was quite uh, fluent, but one thing was constant. I saw firsthand now how mathematics shapes our understanding of our world and its users are outstanding. Last March, we launched the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence in Toronto in order to continue uh, to grow our province's knowledge-based economy, deliver transformative innovation, breakthroughs, and attract investments and the best talents from around the globe to our province of Ontario. Last year, the Fields Institute began hosting the Machine Learning Advances and Applications Seminar. The seminar uh, brings together hundreds of students and researchers and top academics and industrial data scientists in machine learning. And I am pleased that the Institute is partnering with the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence hosting this seminar. Collaboration like this among our best and brightest is paramount. Artificial intelligence will have an impact on all our lives in almost every possible way. That is how we diagnose and treat diseases, use and interpret data, and help make better decisions in research and industry. And the mathematics, ladies and gentlemen, plays such an important role in artificial intelligence advancement. Virtually every field of research can benefit from mathematics. It will pave the way for disruptive technologies that will help us compete and win in the digital economy. And we want students across the province of Ontario to embrace mathematics at an early age to help us get there. And that's why our government is providing more math supports for elementary schools to improve math scores in our students. We recognize that developing talent in science, technology, and engineering and the maths is essential to building an innovative knowledge-based economy in this province. Already, almost 40,000 students graduate from our universities and colleges in engineering, mathematics, science, and, and maths programs every year. And we want that number to increase. It's the students and the recent graduates, like those here today, who will help us address some of the world's most pressing issues like water scarcity, global warming, and an aging population. And I understand that the symposium is hosting a student night with Martin Herrer giving a talk called On Coin Tosses, Atoms, and the Forest Fires. I'm sure it will be a fascinating talk. I also understand there will be free pizza which, as we know, is essential to solving some of the universe's most complex problems. In Ontario, ladies and gentlemen, we know discoveries lead to economic growth. Investments in innovation and research is investments in economic development. And that's why, occasionally, I refer to my ministry as Ministry of Economic Development for tomorrow. And tomorrow begins today. So that's why we are committed 
to supporting Ontario's research and innovation communities. We also know mathematics plays an essential and fundamental role in our future prosperity. So thank you for showing us the miracle of mathematics and how it can transform our world. So best wishes to everyone on a great symposium. And again, my sincere congratulations uh, to Dr. Martin Herrer for receiving this prestigious medal. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Mikvich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister Maridi, for those very useful and timely remarks. Um, we always like to hear people say good things about mathematics. <clears throat> I'd next like to uh, introduce uh, Charles Reguer, the Vice President Provost at the University of Toronto. Uh, Professor Reguer is a distinguished scholar and academic leader, Professor of Social Work with a cross appointment, the Faculty of Law, whose practice background includes over 20 years of direct service in forensic social work and emergency mental health. The University of Toronto, of course, has a special place for us as the host institution of the Fields Institute. And now I'd like to ask Professor Reguer to say us a few words. Thank you very much, Ian, and it's a great pleasure to follow Minister Moridi, who is a tremendous friend of uh, science in the province, but uh, a tremendous friend of the University of Toronto. And uh, we're grateful for all he does uh, for us. And I'm very pleased to be here today welcoming you on behalf of the University of Toronto to this wonderful event and, uh, and congratulate the Fields Institute on its 25th anniversary. Uh, you all probably know that the Fields Institute is a remarkable place at, that plays an important role as part of University of Toronto's extended community. Um, but you, what you might not know is that the history of the Fields Institute at University of Toronto stems back to the 1880s, uh, which, as I learned from Wikipedia, the authoritative source of all information, uh, is when John Charles Fields was a student at the University of Toronto, and then he returned again in 1902 to teach at the University of Toronto. Uh, John Charles Fields had a vision for mathematical research and scholarship as evidenced by the Fields Medal that he began planning in the 1920s. And uh, we are delighted to now, at this time, be hearing from one of the recent winners. So uh, today, the Fields Institute is broadly celebrated as the locus of Canada's most intense mathematical research activity. And it's certainly a hallmark of excellence for around the world. It contributes in so many ways to the rich life at University of Toronto, and today's Fields Medal Symposium is a perfect example of this. It welcomes prominent visitors from around the world, including Professor Martin Herrer. Uh, and uh, so this is an obvious reflection of the kinds of contributions that it makes to the university and to our community. Um, as Ian indicated, it also offers lectures, workshops, awards, courses, um, and gives members of our U of T community a front row seat in some of the world's greatest puzzles and field changing theories. In addition, uh, the incredible partnerships that the Fields Institute uh, continues to, to uh, engage in. We have colleagues and students from a vast array of disciplines who collaborate in uh, uh, developing new ideas and new opportunities. And the partnerships with local industry and the ongoing partnership with uh, some of our innovation hubs, such as U of T's engineering hatchery, contribute to the thriving entrepreneurial community and facilitates the incubation of startup companies. And so, uh, while many view the uh, Fields Institute to be a fortress of mathematical wizardry, which it is, uh, it's truly a part of the vibrant academic community here at University of Toronto and the City of Toronto itself, contributing to 
uh, extraordinary, diverse, and dynamic landscape. So uh, this is now the sixth year of the Fields Medal Symposium. And uh, it's wonderful that it's kicking off with a free open lecture tonight. And the symposium is really a reminder of the power and joy of pure curiosity, imagination, and discovery. And at a time where we're talking about research funding and really talking about the importance of basic research, this is an incredible example of that. We need these reminders more than ever in our turbulent world and in a world that's really looking for quick answers to things. Uh, bringing together students and scholars and the general public in an evening like this is truly a marvel and uh, allows us to connect with a shared wonder. So uh, this really does build our community of scholars and learners both within the, the university and within this great city. And on behalf of the university, I extend my congratulations and thanks to Professor Herrer and uh, appreciate him coming here today, and to the Fields Institute and the symposium's organizers. Uh, I know that you're going to enjoy this evening's lecture because I actually watched part of one of Professor Herrer's lectures on YouTube, the other great source of information in our society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Regeer, for those warm and words. <clears throat> and now, in the next part of the program, uh, I, my pleasure to, uh, to call in Sylvia Safati, who's educated in France, a professor of mathematics at the Corin Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University, distinguished, highly cited publication record in, oops, I'm losing a laptop here, in partial differential equations, statistical mechanics. Uh, winner of several prizes, the Henri Poincaré Prize in 2012 and Special Prize of the French Academy of Sciences in 2013. Please, Professor Sfati, come and say a few words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so as you heard, we are all here this week to uh, celebrate the work of Martin Heirer in a conference with uh, many distinguished speakers at the Fields Institute. And uh, in fact, I thought about it. It's very rare to have a conference organized in your honor when you're a mathematician in your 40s. It actually only happens when you have the Fields Medal. You have to realize this. Now, I'll tell you a little secret in case there are some non-mathematicians in the room. Having a conference in your honor when you're 60, that's easy happens to a lot of people. <laughs> but when you're 40, much harder. You have to have the Fields Medal. So as you heard, as you probably know, the Fields Medal is one of the two most prestigious distinctions in mathematics, certainly the most famous. Journalists tend to be fascinated with it. They even like to compare it to the Nobel Prize, except that as you know, there is no Nobel Prize in mathematics, and the Fields Medal doesn't come from Sweden. It comes originally from Canada, which is why we're here. Um, and so it's a big deal for mathematicians, for a mathematician to have the, the Fields Medal. But despite all this glory and fame, what is uh, maybe special about Martin is that it hasn't gotten to his head at all. I can really tell you that. And he's remained essentially the same person, the most unpretentious, unassuming, pleasant, in fact, the most normal, especially among mathematicians. <laughs> and really, if you know him, you know this, he's one of the most pleasant people in the profession. We really appreciate him for that. So behind this Normality, there is still something special. There is, a, there is a brilliant mind, certainly, and there is a, maybe you don't know this, a genius programmer. Um, it's sort of funny to learn that on the side, as a hobby, you know, when he was in his, 20, uh, in his 20s, Martin created a software which is actually the leading 
sound processing software in the world, simply. And has sold millions of copies. So, you know, it's not so common that you meet someone like that. And I wouldn't be completely surprised if I learned today that he has another, like, hidden talent that I had never heard about. Um, so I recall my, the first time that I met Martin. It was, uh, it was in 99, if you remember. <laughs> he was a PhD student at the time. And I was a fresh PhD. I had just graduated. And I was visiting the University of Geneva. So you may know, or now is the time to learn that, Martin grew up m mainly in Geneva. Um, and actually, if you speak, uh, if you're a native speaker of either French, German, or English, so English, there must be some here, um, you can go and talk to Martin in that language and you will come out convinced that that is his native tongue. Um, it works for French, at least, I can tell you. So I was visiting the University of Geneva and uh, Jean-Pierre Ekman, who is here somewhere. Jean-Pierre, wake up. Um, <laughs> And at, that, at some point, Jean-Pierre uh, asked me to give him like a sort of private lecture about what I was doing. And he told me, there's, there's going to be a student of mine, Martin, who is going to come and join. And so Martin sat in the room. I started to explain. And he was like clearly listening, started asking questions and blah. And then at some point, I remember thinking, wow, who's this guy who seems to understand my stuff better than I do myself? So I was really, really very impressed with Martin at that time. And then when years passed and I heard about all his achievements, you know, and, and his, his fame that started to build and build, I was really not that surprised, in fact. So um, let's talk a little bit about Martin's work to conclude. Uh, one thing that distinguishes Martin other than his wonderful personality is also his way of thinking about stuff and about mathematics. And, and really, um, he has a, a way of thinking of the problems, which I think many of us would agree is, is kind of orthogonal to what everybody else had been thinking. You know, like he, he approaches a problem in a very personal, a very outside the box way. And maybe that's what leads him to these wonderful discoveries. Um, he really doesn't follow the, the crowds or the trends. And the theory that he has built is really something special. It has been compared to a cathedral. It has been compared to Lord of the Rings, I heard. Um, and it, it, it's really a, a sort of immense building that's very intricate and yet beautiful. It's, it's hundreds of pages. It, resembles nothing else, really, in mathematics. And it has opened up a whole field of study. Um, and what this theory does, it, it's about giving a meaning to equations that usually come from physics. And you know, Martin is also very interested in physics. And I think that at some point in his studies, because he was kind of gifted at everything, he was hesitating also, uh, also with physics. And, and so he saw these equations that physicists were writing, and that didn't make sense to mathematicians because there were some terms in there that were infinite. The equations were kind of like infinity equals infinity minus blah, which, you know. Um, and his theory is about making sense of these equations, and it really opens up um, whole um, possibilities and um, finally a very satisfactory uh, fact of understanding what these things can mean. Uh, and, and it even seems like some of his uh, experience in sound processing had played a role in his inspiration. Anyway, so tonight I think you will have a chance to hear a little bit about, about that, about these uh, infinities and how to tame them. And so since uh, Martin is also a great um, exposer, you will have uh, I think a good time, and you're, you're lucky. So, so, so enjoy this, and without further delay, Martin. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind words. 
Um, and of course, I would like to thank the uh, Fields Institute for organizing this uh, very pleasant event. Uh, so the, uh, the, the kind of infinities that I want to talk about uh, today, as uh, was already mentioned, so they actually, so let me try to so first show you historically when, how these things came up uh, and how people started to think about them. And that actually goes back to the uh, late 20s. Uh, so that was back in the time when people were building a quantum, trying to build a quantum theory of electrodynamics. And so that was around the time where, you know, relatively early on after the uh, discovery of quantum mechanics. And, well, people did, you know, what you always do in physics, which is that you try to make a, an educated guess of what your physical theory should look like, but then a physical theory sort of, you know, it comes with various parameters, so, you know, like mass of the electron or speed of light or whatever, right? So you have a kind of a guess of the form of the theory, but typically you don't have an a priori guess for the values of these parameters, so what you actually have to do uh, is you have to go out and measure things. Um, and so the way you relate the two is that your theory actually helps to make predictions about the measurements that depend on these parameters. And so then you measure various experiments. And once you've made enough measurements, that's sort of enough to determine the parameters. And once you've determined all of the parameters, you can make new predictions um, that then give you, you know, that's sort of the whole point of the physical theory is to then at some point make predictions where you can really predict something new when the theory says something about the world rather than the world saying something about the theory. Right? Um, and so the whole point here is obviously that for this to work, uh, your theory needs to have just finitely many parameters that show up in it because otherwise you're never done you know, figuring out what the values of the parameters are. You so would need infinitely many experiments in order to just figure out what your theory is, and then there's no point. Um, and so what happened in that theory of quantum electrodynamics that people started to build was that, well, so for certain types of experiments, so I'm not going to go into the details of the physics, uh, and it's not my expertise anyway, the, uh, the theory in some sense sort of spits out results, not really as numbers, but actually as somehow formal power series. So there's a constant of physics, which is called the uh, fine structure constant, which has you know, a fixed value, so it's an actual number. It doesn't come with a unit, so it's one of the few physical constants that actually are pure numbers. It's about 1 over 137. Um, and so the outcomes are expressed as a power series in that number. So something times some number plus something times alpha plus something times alpha square, etc. And so what people first did is that instead of computing this whole series, because the coefficients were given by some very complicated expressions, you know, you just compute the first term. And you say, well, that's some sort of approximation to my theory, and so you make predictions from that. And so that worked reasonably well, but it didn't explain some phenomena that you could observe. And so then they tried to go to the second order. And there what happened is that things started to go really badly wrong. And so it turns out that when you try to compute the uh, of coefficient in front of the second term in that power series, you know, you, you have to compute some very complicated integral. And then it turns out that the answer is just infinity. And well, you know, that's pretty bad, right? So I mean, if you, you know, as an undergraduate, you learn about all these criteria for series to converge or so. So here it's not about the ser series not converging. It's about the second term in the series already being infinite. And so then that's it, right? Game's over. Um, and so, so what do you do? So of course, the, you know, the first reaction would be, well, you know, the starting point was to make an educated guess. So maybe, you know, you just weren't educated enough and you made the wrong guess. Um, but of course, you know, these guys were really smart. 
and so they, uh, they did hang on to their gas. And so they tried to fix it somehow. So how do you fix this? Well, so the first fix essentially was something like, well, whenever you see an infinity, you just kind of throw it away. You pretend that it's finite, and you just take it as a parameter in your theory. Right? Um, but you do this in a somewhat smart way. And the way you do it is, well, you know, as I told you, the reason why you have these infinities showing up is that you have some complicated function that you had to integrate, um, and the integral turned out to be infinite. And so then what you do is, well, you see one of these complicated functions, and you know, the reason why the integral is infinite is because the function somehow goes to infinity very fast somewhere. And so then what you do is you just say, well, I pretend that this is finite, so I just give it a name. And I say, well, so now it's just one of the parameters in my theory, and then I can still use that to make predictions and try to determine the parameter, right? So that's fair game. Um, but now, of course, you, you, know, you start to run into this problem that you know, if you do that, that every time you hit one of these infinities, you just add a new parameter in your theory, well, you know, then you're back with the problem that you end up with a theory that has infinitely many parameters, and then it's just not a theory because it will never make any predictions. Right? And so then there's no point either. And so what you do is you say, well, if you're lucky, then you know, maybe you have one of these functions that sort of blows up in a certain way, and then you pretend that this is finite, so you give it a name. And then maybe you know, the next time, somewhere else in the theory, you encounter one of these functions that's not integrable. Well, if it sort of looks the same as the first one, then you should give it a name, but you should actually give it the same name as the first one. Right? So if it kind of blows up in the same way, uh, then you should give that infinity kind of the same name as the other infinity. Okay, and then if you're lucky, there's only sort of finitely many types of blow up that show up. Um, and so then you're back in a nice situation where you only have finitely many parameters and you have a real physical theory. Okay, so you do that, and it works. And it works really well. Uh, but it, you know, it sort of sounds like a cheat, right? And so people weren't too happy with that. And so so here is what, what uh, Dirac had to say about this. Uh, just, this is just not sensible mathematics. Sensible mathematics involves neglecting a quantity when it's small, not neglecting it just because it's infinitely big and you don't want it. Uh, so, so, fair enough. Um, or here's Feynman, who says that the shell game that we play is technically called randomization, but no matter how clever the word, it's still what I would call a DP process. So, so people weren't too happy with this, right? Because it, it really just sounds very ad hoc. So, well, it really sounds like a cheat. Um, but actually, you know, first it works extremely well. And so, so then when, once something works extremely well, you try to sort of rationalize it, right? So you try to figure out the sort of way of why, <laughs> you know, find an explanation of why it works. And so eventually, so let me try to show you sort of a cartoon of the explanation that essentially sort of crystallized right, uh, over the years. So this, um, so it sort of works in the following way. So take any physical theory, okay? So physical theory is sort of always of the same type, which is that you have some cooking recipe uh, that takes as an input the type of experiment for which you want to make a prediction. And then it takes as an input sort of the parameters of the theory, and then it spits out a prediction for that experiment. Okay, so it's, you can view it as a map that has sort of two types of input. The first type is the experiment about which you want to make a prediction, and the second type of input is the parameters of the theory, um, and then the output is the prediction for the experiment in question. Okay, so it's a sort of map like that. Um, but because it's not given as a map, right? It's actually given really as a cooking recipe. In the sense, it's given as a computational procedure of how to compute uh, this output. Right? And so what happened here is that you had a sort of a cooking recipe, and then when you followed the recipe, at some point you have to do an operation that 
this sort of not allowed, right? So you have to say, compute the area under a function which is infinite area, something like this, right? Um, and so what you do is well, you say, well, okay, so I modify my theory in some way in order to guarantee that it spits out something finite, okay? Um, and so I could do this by, for example, saying, well, here in this case, the problem was that you had these functions that kind of blow up and become too big, and so the area under them is infinite, uh, and that's what caused these problems. And so you just somehow chop them off. You say, well, once they become too big, then you, know, you replace it just by some big value or something like this. So you make some modification to your theory so that if you want visually, it sort of still looks more or less the same, uh, but it produces finite outcomes, right? So you introduce some small parameter. So mathematicians always call small parameters epsilon. Um, and then some procedure that, you know, regularizes the theory, which depends on that parameter, and which would have the property that if that parameter is very small, then that new theory is sort of, you know, very close in some sense to the one that you really wanted to explain in the sense that, for example, you chop it off somewhere very, very high R, right? Um, and then, of course, well, that introduces new parameters because, well, you know, you have to say how you actually modified the theory, right? So there are many different ways of regularizing things. So now you end up with all sorts of new parameters that are completely unphysical because, you know, you just change the thing in some sort of arbitrary way pretty much in order to produce finite outcomes. Uh, so you have a whole bunch of new sort of unphysical parameters that show up. Um, but now you have a theory that sort of produces finite outcomes. But it's still, you know, you think, well, you haven't really gained much because what you really want is to send that small parameter you know, to zero, and when you send it to zero, then the things still blow up and you're sort of back in the same problem as before. Um, but now, the, now comes sort of the genius idea that people had which is to say, well, you know, as you send to zero, as you send this small parameter to zero, you can, if you want, you can change the way you parameterize the constants of the theory, right? So remember, so the, the theory has a bunch of constants that describe it, so that's these physical constants here. Um, but they just parameterize, if you want, the space of theories, and now, of course, you would describe them by numbers. But in order to describe them by numbers, so you have to specify how you parameterize this thing. You have to specify units, et cetera. And that's somehow irrelevant, right? So the actual numerical values of these constants are kind of irrelevant. Uh, the only thing which is really relevant is you know, the, the set of theories that these constants actually parameterize. And so what you can do is you can change the parameterization of your set of theories as this small parameter goes to zero. And in many cases, it turns out that you can simultaneously find a way of changing the parameterization of your set of theories. So that's just a purely somehow, it doesn't change the theories, it just changes the way you assign a numerical value to a specific theory, but it doesn't change the set of theories that you're considering. Uh, and so you change this parameterization as epsilon goes to zero, and you change it in such a way that there is a limiting theory which actually produces perfectly nice finite values. Okay? And furthermore, in many cases, it turns out that you can do that in such a way that this limiting theory, you know, the set of limiting theories that you get is actually the same independently of how you did this regularization and this chopping off thing. Um, and so then you have a, you know, sort of very reasonable to call that sort of the, if you want, unique theory, which is sort of described by, um, you know, the, what you started from at the beginning. And, you know, that works extremely well. So, for example, so the moral of the story here is that in many cases, especially somehow in in physics, what matters is somehow more the form of a theory, okay, rather than you know, the specific values of the 
constants that appear in it. Okay, so what's really important here is that of the, uh, the set of theories that these constants describe rather than the individual guys. Um, so, so this guy here, Toft, so he's the person, by, for example, who showed that the uh, standard model, which is you know, sort of the best shot that we have at the moment at the kind of theory of everything, except that it doesn't include gravity, but everything else, um, that that theory is re what one calls renormalizable, which essentially means that the procedure that I just outlined kind of works. Okay? Um, and that really works. I mean, that's basically, you know, sort of basically LHC, uh, which, you know, was built at great cost. Basically, the whole point is to try, well, try to fault the theory, right? So as a, you can never prove that the theory is correct. I mean, it's not clear philosophically what that even means. Uh, the only thing that you can possibly prove is that it's wrong. Uh, and so you somehow, you know, make larger and larger machines to sort of try to prove that it's wrong, and you haven't been able to do it yet. Okay, so it works pretty well. Um, so here is a sort of cartoon picture, right, of sort of what I meant with this reparametrization, right? So, so think here of each point of this curve as being a theory, okay? So each point here is a theory, and so, so here these theories are parametrized by one number, Okay, which is sort of where you are, your position on that curve. So say that's the theory that corresponds to that number equal zero, that's the one that corresponds to the number equal one, that's the number equal two, okay? Um, and now let's think that this is, so in the picture that I just explained, this would be one of these theories which, with some finite value of epsilon, which is supposed to approximate some kind of limiting theory. And now you could, end up in a situation that if you keep these numbers here equal, then as you make epsilon smaller and smaller, something like this happens, right? That you see what happens here is that if you look at the curve of all of these theories, that curve certainly converges to a nice limiting curve, which I just drew as a straight line here, okay? But if you fix one of the values of these parameters, uh, and you send your parameter epsilon to zero, then here in this case, all of these points just sort of collapse to one point. And you don't somehow see, you know, the whole set of theories that you get in the limit. So here what you would have to do is you would have to change units as epsilon goes to zero in such a way that in the new unit, sort of c equal one would be somewhere here or something, right? So you would have to kind of blow things up uh, in such a way that you, you know, you really get a parametrization of this curve in the limit and you don't just have everything collapsing to a point. Right? So that's the kind of thing that you should, uh, the kind of cartoon that you should have in mind here. Um, or actually, so what I mean, in reality, it's more like, so for example, what could happen is that as you make epsilon smaller and smaller and you keep the constant C fixed, these points sort of run away to infinity, right? And then you would have to sort of pull them back by just making a sort of change of variables, right? So that they actually converge to something on the limiting curve instead of just running off to infinity. Um, so here, let me now try to give you a sort of more precise example uh, where, you know, exactly the same, the same sort of thing happens. So now this one is more, so that's more for the sort of mathematically inclined people in the audience. So I think there are quite a few mathematicians, so I think I, I can do some math. Um, so, so here, remember that, okay, so a distribution is something which basically just ta takes as input a function and spits out a number in a linear way in the sense that if you give it the sum of two functions, it spits out the sum of the two numbers. Um, and that's something which has a little bit the same sort of flavor. So you should think of the function that you give to it as being something like your experiment, and then the number that it spits out as being something like your prediction, okay? Um, and so one example would be the one that simply, you know, you give it a function and it spits out the value of the function, say, at zero, for example. Um, 
Another example of distribution, which is much more generic, is you fix a fixed function, which I called eta hat here. And now the way your distribution works, you give it a function phi, and what it does is it multiplies it with that fixed function, and then it computes the area under it, under the new function you get in that way, and so that gives you a number. So that's the number it spits out. Um, it turns out that you can always approximate every distribution by something of that type. And so now the question is, can we define uh, a distribution which a two-parameter family of distribution? So that would be, these two parameters would be something like the physical constants in my theory, if you want. Okay, so now it's a theory of two parameters. So can you define something like a distribution which corresponds to some constant divided by absolute value of x minus a constant times this delta distribution? And so here the problem is that you know, one of the absolute value of x is a function that looks like this, which has infinite area here. And so the area is infinite in both directions. Sort of this bit here has infinite area, and these two tails here have infinite area as well. Um, and so if you just take some fixed function, you know, nice and smooth function, you multiply it by this, well, the thing you obtain is still going to have infinite area. Okay? And so there you have a problem, which is that what does this bit mean, right? If you interpret it in this way, uh, you have exactly this problem of trying to compute an area which is actually infinite, so it doesn't make any sense. Right? Um, and so now what happens is, well, we can do the same sort of procedure, right? So we can somehow chop it off. So we say it's the problem here is that one of x becomes very, very big if x is very large. And so we just introduce a small parameter, which is epsilon, and we replace one over x by one over x plus epsilon. And so now it's, it never becomes bigger than one over epsilon. Right? Uh, and so now the area under this is certainly going to be finite because it never gets bigger than a certain value. Um, and so now I have, a, you know, I have a perfectly nice way of defining the distribution, a over x plus epsilon minus constant times the delta function. So now I have a two-parameter family of distributions. And so now I can try to send some high epsilon to zero. And of course, if I just send it to zero, I have exactly the same problem again. It's that I end up with something which has infinite area, and so it doesn't converge. And turns out, on the other hand here, is if I define a family of distributions in this way, um, then this actually converges, right? So I take here any function chi, which is sort of 1 near 0, and then it's 0 further away. Um, and so in this definition, if x is very small, these two terms here sort of cancel each other out because phi of x is going to be very close to phi of 0. Uh, and so it kind of cancels out this divergency here. And so there's absolutely no problem making epsilon very small, and it converges to a limit. It's always going to be the same limit whichever way you approximate this. And on the other hand, this expression here, you can actually rewrite it in this form because this term that I added here is just some number times phi of zero, so it's actually of the same type as this. Okay, so it's actually really just a change of variables in my two-parameter family. And here it's sort of clear if you do the calculation that this converges to a nice limit, and the limit really doesn't depend on how you regularize things. All right, so here, it's exactly this situation where you, you just take a pretty much arbitrary way of fixing things. It seems completely arbitrary. It gives you different answer for different ways of fixing it. Um, but then if you sort of try to remove the fix and just do a reparametrization, the family of limits that you get uh, is always the same, whichever way you fix things. You always get the same family in the limit. And the number of parameters in the family is sort of the same is what you started with. So you have this kind of two-parameter family. Okay. So now let's switch to a completely different example, um, which comes from uh, stochastics or finance, if you want, um, which is the following. So, so take a, something like a random walk. So a random walk just means you, know, you stand here, you toss a coin, if it comes up head, you make a step to the right. If it comes up tails, you make a step to the left. 
and you just do that repeatedly. So you end up sort of moving right and left. Sometimes you move further right, sometimes you move further left. So sort of wiggle back and forth randomly. And now you do that faster and faster. So instead of tossing a coin sort of every second, you toss a coin every millisecond or every microsecond. Um, and of course, you're going to move so super fast. So if you want to get some kind of limiting process, you have to make smaller and smaller steps. Uh, and it turns out that the correct way of actually getting a limit is that if you, you know, toss your coin every epsilon time, your, the size of your step should be about square root of that epsilon so that you get something, some limiting process, which is called the Brownian motion. Okay, so Brownian motion is something like this. So now this would be a plot of the position as a function of time. So you see you sort of move a little bit, say this is right, this is left. So you move a bit to the right and you move to the left and to the right again. But you sort of move in a very, very erratic way, right? So you make these kind of little random motions. Um, and so this process, this Brownian motion, it's, sort of, it's one of the most fundamental, if you want, random processes is sort of the simplest uh, random process that appears in mathematics. Um, and so it actually appears in many places in, uh, um, in real life, if you want. I mean, if you look at uh, you know, curves of the stock market, locally they kind of look like something like this, right? And there's a good reason why they look like this. It's because actually the mechanism that makes stock prices move is you know, at least locally sort of for reasonably short time scales is actually very similar to the mechanism that I just described, where if investors, you know, sell a share, uh, then there are more shares on the market, so the price goes slightly down. If they buy shares, they're a bit less on the market, so the price goes slightly up, and so you have this erratic random motion with all these different sort of independent investors that buy and sell shares. And so that's basically why, you know, the prices of stocks that you see in the newspapers, they kind of look like this. So this here is a plot of a Brownian motion. So it's just one realization of this Brownian motion. And what I do is I'm sort of zooming out more and more. And so you see it always somehow looks the same. So it's, it has this kind of fractal structure that kind of looks the same at every scale. Um, and I don't know if you can, yeah, maybe you can see. So there's this parabola here. So the meaning of this parabola here is that the way you have to zoom out in order to always see the same is exactly the way that keeps that parabola constant, right? So it means that if you zoom out by a factor of four horizontally, you should zoom out by a factor two, which is square root of four vertically, okay? Um, so that's Brownian motion. So now, you know, so I gave you some sort of intuition of why this random walk is a reasonable model for stock prices, but it's actually not that reasonable, right? Because for starters, the stock price doesn't turn negative. Right? It's always positive. And then sort of the amount by which the stock price changes in response to of these events is typically kind of proportional to the value of the stock, right? I mean, if the stock price is $100, then it might change by about a dollar, you know, within the next day. If the stock price is only $1 to start with, then it's obviously not going to change by a dollar, right? I mean, it might change by a cent. Okay, so the amount by which the stock price is going to change is typically about proportional to the value of the stock itself. So a better model for stock prices is something like that, where instead of at every step, instead of moving by some random amount after every step, you move by a random amount which is proportional to the value of the stock at the moment when you make the move, right? So that's somehow a more reasonable model for stock price. And so now you can ask yourself, well, since that guy, if I make this parameter type, this parameter type silent, it's just some sort of artificial parameter. It just says that I make some kind of discrete model where I assume that things just make a move every epsilon time. It shouldn't have much of a meaning, so you would really want to send this small parameter to zero. So you can ask yourself, is this model related to this model in some way, right? So can I relate the two limits? So now if you look at this model here, um, I can write it as in this way, right? So it says that the, uh, the increment, the amount by which my stock price changes over this time interval is equal to the value of the stock itself times the amount by which 
this random walk here changes over the same time interval. Okay, so here I've just rewritten this. Um, and now if I divide both sides here by the time interval itself, then this looks like a derivative, right? So that's how we teach the derivative side, so of little vertical increment divided by little horizontal increment. Um, and then, of course, the, what we always say when we teach undergraduates derivatives is, well, you know, you sort of make some kind of little approximation like this, you draw a little tangent, you know, and then you just make it smaller and smaller, you send this little interval to zero, and in the end you get your derivative, right? So you'd want to do the same thing here and say that, well, the derivative of this guy is equal to its value times the derivative of that guy, and so you get a differential equation and you can solve it. So you just get this formula here. It turns out that that's the wrong answer in this case. Okay, so if you, if you take this model here and you make epsilon very small, you don't get this, but you actually get this. Um, and it's possible to guess that because actually, you know, the average amount of your, of the average value of your stock price here in this model doesn't change, right? Because this guy here on average doesn't change. So that was my step in my random walk where I have half chance of going right, half chance of going left. So on average, I don't move, right? So this guy on average doesn't move. And so the expected value of my stock price at time after any time should be the same as the expected value at the initial time here. So it's true for this model here, and so it should be true in the limit, but it's not true for this model here. Okay, and so you can check that if you subtract this term, then it becomes true. Okay, so that's more reasonable, and actually you can prove that what you get in the limit is actually this uh, rather than this. But so now, you know, what actually went wrong? I mean, we had almost a proof that you should get this model here in the limit. Um, and what went wrong is, of course, we're not really allowed to differentiate these things. Right? So, oops. So remember, this uh, Brownian motion looks like this. And so what, what we said here is we have this differential equation which says that the slope of my asset price is the slope of the Brownian motion times the value of the asset price itself. Um, but you know, if you look at this curve, it doesn't really look like it has a slope anywhere. Right? Um, and it's actually clear because remember in the movie that we saw earlier, this Brownian motion, it somehow, you know, it looks always the same under this zooming out procedure, but it was the zooming out procedure that keeps this parabola fixed. And so it means that it actually really sort of looks like this parabola horizontally, but that parabola had infinite slope, right? Because the, the origin was precisely the point where it was vertical. Right? Um, and so actually you can show that, you know, this Brownian motion just doesn't have any slope. And you can already also see it by the fact that we move by square root of epsilon every epsilon time. And so the speed at which we move would be square root epsilon divided by epsilon, which also blows up for small values of epsilon. Right? Um, okay, and so, so that's what goes wrong here, is that somehow um, these slopes become infinite, and so you, know, you write down this differential equation, but it's actually, it actually doesn't really have a meaning, that differential equation, right? And so, well, you, formally you can find a solution for it, but well, in this particular case, it turns out to actually be the wrong solution. Um, so the consequence of this here is that you can get, de depending, so if you take you know, you write down the same differential equation and you can interpret it as, you know, somehow a limit of various discrete equations of the same type as the relation that I wrote down earlier. So you could, for example, interpret the same equation as the limit of a recurrence like that as epsilon goes to zero. There are various other recurrences that you could write down that at least, you know, with the same sort of back of the envelope argument should give you the same limit. And it turns out here that all of these different approximations, they actually all give you different limits, but not that many. So now the limit that you would get will always be of that type. So it will always be of the form, this exponential of Brownian motion, which is the thing that you expect, minus some constant times t. And it's just the value of that constant that's going to be different uh, for different approximations. And so the, uh, so the moral of the story here is that 
well, you know, sometimes you have these, in probability theory, you have these quite singular random objects that appear, and you know, they come with various natural ways of approximating them. And so in many cases, what happens is that you know, the details of how you approximate these objects do matter, so you get somehow different limits uh, by taking different approximations, but they don't matter too much in the sense that although you might get different limits for different approximations, somehow the set of possible limits that you get is quite small. So maybe you, know, you just have so one constant that parameterizes this or something like that. And so that's something that appears in many different contexts. So um, one sort of model that probabilists like a lot is called the uh, easing model. So the easing model, sort of a model for uh, what goes on in a magnet, um, close to the transition at which it loses its magnetization. Right? So if you take a magnet and you heat it up, then at some point it actually loses its magnetization. So above a certain temperature, uh, the magnet just becomes sort of inert, if you want. And so the, this easing model is some kind of a toy model for what goes on in a magnet, where you know, what goes on in the magnet is as if you want every atom in your magnet works itself kind of like a little magnet. And these little magnets, they all want to, they have a tendency of wanting to line up. Okay? Uh, but then on the other hand, temperature has a tendency of you know, making them want to just be disordered somehow, right? So temperature um, is basically the same as disorder, if you want. And so a simple model here is to say, well, you know, I model each of these little atoms by just a number that takes only the value plus one or minus one, so which somehow says either it points up, it's a little magnet that points up or it points down. Um, and then I say, well, so my, my magnet is now modeled by a whole lattice of atoms, okay? So that at every lattice point, you have either plus one or minus one, so it's both points up or down at every lattice point. And you say, well, I take one of these configurations at random, but the probability with which I pick a configuration is not uniform, so they don't all have exactly the same probability, but I make the probability proportional to this quantity here, and the important fact about this quantity is that it becomes big if they're aligned, and it's sort of small if they don't align, right? So if, the, if two neighboring, so this here means two neighboring positions, uh, so if two neighboring guys have the same value, so if sigma x is equal to sigma y, so if they're either both plus one or both minus one, then the product is one, and if they have opposite values, then one is one, one is minus one, so the product is minus one, Okay, so in one case, I have the exponential of something positive, which is big, or in the other case, something negative, which is small, right? So, so you want to have sort of higher probability of being aligned than of not being aligned. And there's one parameter here, which is essentially the temperature. So if that parameter is zero, that means you just don't care about this value here, and then they're all equally probable, and then you just choose for each of them, either you do a coin toss, basically, for each of them. Um, and in the other case, if this value here is infinite, which actually corresponds to zero temperature, so temperature of one over the value of that parameter. So if the value is very large, well, then it means that with very high probability, things should be aligned, right? And so here are three pictures of what you typically see for different values of that parameter. So for um, high value, they want to be aligned, and so you typically see, so here there are two possible values, plus or minus one, which is yellow or black. Okay, and so here, if beta is large, then what you would typically see is that things tend to be aligned, so either they are mostly yellow or they are mostly black. Right? And so what you see here is, you see something like this, which is mostly yellow and then with a bit of black in, inside, or sometimes you would see the other way around, mostly black with a little bit of yellow inside. On the other hand, if beta is very small at higher temperature, you see something like this, right, where they're basically more or less, you know, it looks completely random if you want. Right? Um, 
And then somewhere, there's a transition between these two pictures. So somewhere it looks like this, or because it looks much more interesting. Right? And so that would correspond to the behavior, which is just at the temperature where you actually lose the magnetization. Right? So it's what's called the critical temperature. So let me show you. A, so here is a sort of animated version of this. Right? Um, so here would be the situation where you're at high temperature, so things tend to be completely disordered. So if I now go to low temperature, it sort of looks like this. Right? So at low temperature, now they tend to align. Right? And so you have these regions that form where things are aligned, and then they move very slowly, and eventually one of the two colors wins, and you just see everything in one color. Um, and somewhere in between, right, you have behavior like this. So this is what happens. So here is a temperature which is very, very close to this critical temperature. And so here what happens, you have you know, very interesting behavior where you see you know, some sort of rich behavior at all scales, uh, and you want to understand what's going on there. Now, in two dimensions, this is relatively well understood. Well, of course, the real world is somehow three-dimensional. Um, and in three dimensions, it's very, very poorly understood. So actually, um, people have very, very little information about this uh, in three dimensions. So there are some guesses by physicists. There, there's very little mathematical uh, information about what happens in three dimensions. Um, and so in particular, one thing that one conjectures or is that at this critical temperature, this toy model actually is a relatively good description of reality in the sense that you, know, you could come up with many other kind of toy models for this transition. Um, and you know, they would all have similar features. And in particular, when you have at the critical temperature for any of these toy models, the behavior at very large scales should always be the same. Okay, so there's a some kind of universality conjecture which says that there's a very, very large class of toy models you can write down. There are many, many mathematical models you could write down. At this, they all have different critical temperatures. They would, you know, in their details, they would look very different. Um, but their behavior on large scale should always be the same when you're at this critical temperature. Okay? And so then one thing you could ask yourself is, is somehow one of these models more natural than all the others? Right? So this model is there's something arbitrary. So I arbitrarily somehow choose uh, to put things on a square grid. On a lattice, I could have changed the lattice. I could change the interaction a little bit. So there are many, many models of this type I could write down. They would all be slightly different. Right? So there's nothing, if you want, special about this model. Uh, so you can ask yourself if there's one which is somehow more special than the others. And well, it turns out that there is. So there's, so OK, so I wrote down here an equation, which is the equation that somehow is supposed to describe this model. Uh, I can show you a movie. So, so here, so this here is a movie of an object which is called the free field, um, which is, okay, so it's somehow a natural mathematical object um, that describes a number of, uh, of physical situations. Um, it's a continuum, so it's an ideal, there's an idealized somehow continuum object random continuum object here. So this one isn't a good model for this transition. So it has a, somehow if you look at the behavior here, it actually behaves, it doesn't quite look like the previous movie that I showed you about the behavior of this easing model at the critical temperature. Um, but then it turns out that there's exactly, or conjecturally, exactly one model, which is the one shown in this movie here, which has the property that it should be a good model for the behavior of a magnet at this transition in the sense that when you look at it at large scales, it should look like the easing model. And what you see here 
you know, if you remember the movie I showed you earlier, here you see very similar features. So you have somehow these relatively large regions of light, large regions of dark, and they have somehow structured every scale. Uh, so you see very similar behavior at these large scales. And on small scales, this one really behaves like this free field that I showed on the uh, previous animation, which is another somehow very canonical uh, natural mathematical object. And so you can write down you can write down one equation that, if you want, describes a model which has the feature that, you know, on very large scales, it behaves like this model of a magnet at the critical temperature. On, one, on very small scales, it behaves like this free field. Um, and so there, there's, a, again, a conjecture that this is somehow the only one. It is basically, it's completely, um, uniquely specified basically by the two properties uh, that I just told you. So this would be in some sense a more canonical model. Um, but then the problem with this equation is that actually it doesn't really have a meaning. Okay, because uh, so in this equation, so here this symbol phi is about, you know, um, denotes the magnetic field at a position in space and time. Um, so here this is the derivative in the time direction. This is the derivative, sort of the second derivative in the space direction. And then you have a term, which is the cube of the field. And then you have another term, which is some kind of noise term, which makes it random, right? So, so it creates, it generates the randomness that you saw in these movies. And now why is this cube term a problem? Well, you see, you know, you see in these movies that you see this kind of flickering the movie, right? And so what, this flicker, what happens with this flickering here is that if you did increase the resolution of these movies, okay, so this is of course some sort of discrete approximation because it has somehow the resolution of the screen that I show the movie on. If you were able to increase this resolution more and more and more, this flickering would just get worse and worse, okay? It would actually in some sense flicker more and more at very small scales. And so there's no way you can actually assign really a value to this field at a fixed point. Right? So if you try to zoom into a point, try to measure the value at a point, it just keeps on flickering. It just keeps on sort of taking very large positive values, then very large negative, very large positive, very large negative. So there's no way of actually defining what you really mean by the value at a point of this field. Right? So it's a, if you increase the resolution, that flickering, you know, it never smoothens out. It just goes worse and worse, the better the resolution. Um, and so, you know, what does it mean, you know, to take the cube of something which doesn't actually have a value at that point? Right? So uh, it's clearly a problem. And so it turns out that actually, you know, this term, if you try to take some kind of approximation of this, well, this term sort of becomes infinitely big. And then what you really have to do is you have to make the constant in front of this term infinitely big as well, so the two kind of cancel out. Okay, but they don't, they don't cancel out completely because otherwise I wouldn't have written them in the first place. There's still something finite that's left over. Okay. Um, and so, you know, one thing we would like to do is you know, you would want to understand, you know, why does that actually happen? Um, so this is one of the things that you can actually show. So you can show that, you know, if you take, basically what this theorem says is that, you know, you take a movie at a certain resolution um, for this model here, but you see this model depends on one parameter, which is the value of this constant. And then it says that the higher the resolution, the higher you have to choose the value of this constant in order to see something which sort of more or less looks the same in your screen. Um, and then if you really send the resolution you know, to, to infinity, so if you sort of try to make a sort of infinite resolution movie, then you have to send the value of this constant to infinity as well in order to get you know, some limiting movie uh, on your screen. But then you can show that 
the movie that you get in the limit you want is always the same. So it doesn't depend on whether you approximate it with a, you know, pixels that are aligned sort of in a square grid or in a triangular grid or if you, you know, you can sort of have various different ways of approximating this equation. So there are many, many different ways in which you could go about it. Um, as you increase the resolution, you always see the same object in the limit, okay? No matter how you try to approximate it, okay? Um, so let me sort of give you, sort of in the last two minutes, just say one or two words uh, about the way in which you can actually prove things like this, okay? So you see, the problem is you have, you know, you have something like some sort of very wild kind of object like this, and you want to somehow define what you mean by the cube of something like that, which doesn't really have a value at any point. Um, and so it turns out that, well, even though this looks extremely wild, okay, uh, in some sense, you can actually describe it as if it were a nice and smooth function. So usually, right, so usually when we have a, an actual nice and smooth function, uh, what does it mean to be kind of nice and smooth? Well, it means that if you take any point on your curve, so, well, you can approximate it. First, you can approximate it reasonably well by a straight line, right? But then you can approximate it even better by a parabola. Uh, and then you can approximate it even better by a polynomial of degree three, et cetera, right? So it sort of means that at every point, you can actually approximate it very well by a polynomial, and there's kind of some small error term. So that's what it means to be smooth. And obviously, that's not the case here, right? So this really doesn't look smooth at all. So you can't approximate this by a polynomial at all. But, uh, as I already mentioned, you know, this guy has the property that at least at small scales, it actually looks like that guy, which is this free field that I mentioned, which is very well understood. So the idea is to say, well, I take, you know, instead of trying to, for example, approximate my object by something like a linear function, I approximate it by that guy here. All right, so I actually replace the polynomials by you know, some kind of wild random objects of this type, you know, in order to approximate the object that I'm really after. Okay, and it turns out that um, that actually really works. So you can set up a whole theory where you replace polynomials by things that are, you know, not smooth at all, don't look like polynomial at all, uh, but have, you know, various properties that are actually very, very similar to the properties of polynomials. Um, and then you can rebuild sort of the whole, all of analysis that we kind of know. So all, all theories of, you know, all various function spaces, you can have analogs of these function spaces or, you know, pretty much all the operations that you use in analysis where somewhere at the back, there's always this idea that a function is really approximated by a polynomial. Uh, you can rewrite pretty much all of analysis in this context where you replace polynomials by something completely different. Um, and then the point here is to use something different which you understand very well and which approximates the object that you're after. And so then you only need to make, be able to make sense of this operation of taking the cube, for example, for these objects that you understand much better. And then once you control these, then, well, you know, you have a chance of being able to control anything that sort of looks like these objects. Um, it turns out that you can you know, use this idea then to actually really show that what I just told you is true. Um, and so I think I should maybe stop here. So I have, hope I've sort of given you a little bit of a flavor of this uh, idea that sort of came really from the, uh, back from the 30s and 40s. Um, so this idea that, you know, Sometimes you have these mathematical or physical objects that look like they don't really have a real mathematical meaning. Um, 
but there is this procedure, this renormalization procedure that a priori kind of looks slightly weird, or it looks like a cheat somehow that allows you to give a meaning to these objects, but it's actually very natural and you can really you know, work with these. Um, I think I should stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.